as part of my UCAP lecture series. Today, our speaker is going to deliver the lecture on Canadian spatial experiences. Professor Ari Hanan is a professor and head at the Institute of English, University of Kerala, and he has a lot of experience in this area. At present, Professor Ari Haran is the director of UGC Area Study Center for Canadian Studies in University of Kerala, and is also present vice president of the Sastri Indo Canadian Institute in New Delhi. Professor Ari Haran has done major research project and many projects. He had edited a number of books, which in which one of his collections is on women artisans in Kerala's professional theater. Professor Ali Haran translated four books from Malayalam to English. He has a close association with our center, OUCAP, formerly known as ASRC. Professor Ali Haran is a committed academician. He has been inspiring research scholars, students with his intellectual inputs. And he has good rapport with prominent academicians across the country. At the outset, I must be thankful to Professor Kenna Baswaya, former Dean, Faculty of Arts, Eastman University, because of his help, we are able to have great academicians like Professor Arihan. Professor Arihan is going to talk on Canadian spatial experiences. Canada stands unique in the way it expresses space. Its experience is a fascinating subject, for it is a remarkable account of its history. Of course, most of the scholars on YouTube channel and also from this online platform. Some of these students are pursuing PhDs and some of them are working at various universities and degree colleges. I also welcome Dr. Pratibda Mukherjee from Calcutta University and many teachers of Isma University. They are ready to join the lecture of Professor Ariharan, sir. Now I welcome you, sir, to deliver keynote. At the outset, my sincere thanks to you, sir, for accepting to deliver a lecture on behalf of our center. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Professor Nageshwar Rao. Uh, I hope uh, I am audible. There's no rebound because yes, I can hear an echo. Yeah. Uh, let me at the very outset say that I am very thankful uh, to the Osmani University Center for International Programs. Um, for me, it has always been the American Studies Research Center, ASRC. Uh, and I was nostalgic um, when I came online. I was reminded of how I was a visitor there doing research some 30 odd years ago. Uh, so uh, going back in time, is also perhaps a way in which um, we carve, we create, perhaps we discover spaces. And uh, what I intend to do today is to talk exactly about the way in which um, these spaces are created, uh, spaces of the mind, uh, and how we approximate, we create uh, spaces uh, for our everyday life, for daily living, and how it also shapes in a very interesting way uh, Canada as a nation. So this uh, would be the very, very broad uh, framework of what I intend to talk, present today. 
uh, and it's for this reason that I titled my presentation as Canadian Spatial Experiences. Um, Canada uh, is very unique for the way in which um, it expresses spaces and this is what I'll try to uh, share with you some of the ideas that I, that I think I've been able to evolve uh, by looking at maybe six or seven very specific um, examples, uh, illustrations, and then I'll try to talk about each one of them. And uh, that is how uh, I have structured my presentation. So I would like to begin by saying that uh, Canada is very unique in the way in which uh, it expresses spaces. We know that it's a very huge landmass part of the North American continent. Uh, but then uh, what is very, very striking uh, is the fact is the fact that uh, on one side you have the Atlantic Ocean and on the other side the Pacific and to the north you have the Arctic Ocean and then to the south you have the 49th parallel, uh, the imaginary line, uh, the boundary uh, separating Canada and the United States. Now uh, the, the, the geography is very diverse, uh, Western Canada's geography is very distinct, very different from what we have in the east or or in the islands or even up north when we go. Uh, so uh, it's for us uh, a, a huge landmass. But then uh, what it also does is uh, it uh, this landmass or this place uh, uh, offers a remarkable account of um, Canada's evolving history. Uh, Unlike, let's say, uh, the way in which one would talk about European history or even Indian history for that matter, which is very much rooted um, in kingdoms and kings and war, uh, territories, uh, plunder, arson, a whole lot of things are there. Victory, uh, conquest, you, you name it, they're all there. Uh, and that would inform a whole lot of history revolutions for example but then uh, when we look when we try to understand uh, canada's history i think the most striking thing here is that history of canada evolves in a very very fascinating in a very distinct distinctive uh, manner and um, it is possible to really trace uh, this kind of history by looking at the kind of uh, spatial experiences that seem to uh, inform the Canadian imaginary, as it were. But then to do that, it's very essential that we uh, start with geography, and not really history, but then I think it's very essential that we start with geography. Uh, when we go to Canada, I think the most overwhelming thing about Canada is its geography. And this is what uh, overwhelms you when you try to comprehend Canada. Uh, it could be its physical features, it could be its, um, uh, its, its political dimension, it could be the, the demography, the spread. It's got an overwhelming sense of geography. I think that is what I would like to emphasize here. Um, we have to ask now, what is this sense of geography? A sense of geography is a way of describing how we relate and relate to place, and sense of geography. How we relate to place and create space. How we relate to and how we place and create space. So in other words, geography is not um, a landmass. There is a very interesting process of creation that happens when we talk about uh, geography. So it is not uh, the place 
then the way in which we relate to a uh, place and in that process uh, create space so in that sense i would say geography is very very uh, very dynamic and um, it is something that we keep creating out of uh, the same place perhaps uh it's, it's it's quite possible geography then is how people transform and experience where they are so um uh, it's it's not like i said earlier it's not just uh, a place uh, something that we mark on a map but then uh, it is how people transform and experience where they are i would uh, use uh, for the want of a better term i would perhaps uh, say that geography is the whatness of being at a given point uh, if you if you google whatness i don't think you will have something called whatness of being but then essentially that's what i am whatever i am at that point at a given point wherever i am now that is geography so uh, it can be very very specific it can be very individual specific it can be it can be dependent on a number of factors that uh, that go into shaping me at that point in that particular place and that's what would that would possibly define my sense of geography so it could be one can say it could be very very relative but then i would say that more than being very relative uh, i would say that uh, there's a whole lot of subjectivity that is involved there and uh, and i think uh, this is what pretty much informed uh, the the way in which uh, uh, a whole lot of europeans came and settled in canada so uh, i would like to emphasize on that kind of subjectivity what i refer to as the whatness of being at a given point uh, this is what i mean it's not that uh, it's not the usual way in which one would talk about subjectivity i'm trying to theorize this uh, i'm not saying that i've been able to completely theorize this and then arrive at a formulation but these are tentative i'm trying to work my way through this and trying to see whether it is possible to talk about a canadian spatial experience at all um so what i'm going to do now next is to give is to is to share certain illustrations some examples from very specific instances uh, examples of varying degrees so uh, the first um, example that i would like to uh, share here of how these spatial experiences have emerged in kerala in canada and uh, have contributed to the shaping uh, to the evolution of history the first example goes back in time thousands of years ago it goes back to the time when uh, uh, our ancestors asian descendants uh, crossed the bering bridge long ago there was this bridge uh what we would refer to today as the northwest passage we will come back to the northwest passage later uh this passage across this bering bridge that perhaps was one of those early uh, very very fascinating story of uh, the movement of people the migration of people from one continent to another one region to another kind of a landmass uh, without visa and passport uh i think this has a, a whole lot of implications i think this is a very interesting thread that we can pick up when we talk about um, canada uh, uh, opening its doors to a whole lot of people to migrate from from the world so this is a very i've always felt that this is a beautiful opening to really talk about canada this passage across bering bridge because what it also does is that it's a moment it's a moment that creates an ar an archetypal space it creates an archetypal space now we know what archetypes do archetypes are recurring patterns 
archetypal archetypal spaces are also they also do recur so these archetypal spaces i would try to say are recreated in very many different ways today these archetypal spaces are recreated repeated reiterated in very many different ways when for example when we theorize about uh, hyphenated uh, canadians or uh, not so hyphenated canadians we would talk about the indo canadian there's a hyphen there it's a very fascinating thing the hyphen is a very fascinating thing because if we, if we uh, as uh, students of uh, the humanities and social sciences we use the hyphen especially when we write and it starts at one point you draw the slant goes to reaches the other point and uh, it's like it's like a bridge in a way and it looks both ways and it's a very very potent very interesting kind of a narrative uh, it's a very very fascinating narrative that asks us to theorize the idea of belonging the idea of travel the idea of uh, movement from one point to another the crossing of boundaries one can of course go on i'm not doing that uh, i've tried to talk about i've tried to theorize a hyphen i did do that for some time back and i was uh, fascinated to see another essay by roy, roy mickey which came out around the same time 2012 or so where he also tries to talk about a poetics of the hyphen i'm not going into the poetics of the hyphen now but then the fascinating thing here is the way in which the creation of that archetypal space um is reiterated recreated when we talk about migration when we talk about the diaspora the hyphenation the not so hyphenated the not so hyphenated canadians we talk about immigration multiple diasporas now all these describe canada now, it is for this reason that uh, i would try to go back to that point in time uh, where you have this mobility this movement of a people from one part of the world to another part now it has very fascinating implications i think when we look at um, canada today because i would say that it is a spatial exploration or experience it is a spatial experience of the world in canada canada today uh, for me is a microcosm of the world because we just need to look at uh, the kind of people who live there the the variety that we have uh, the cultures the practices the nations uh, who find a home in canada so what we have here with this instance is a special experience of the world in canada I, it is for this reason that i started talking about the creation of an archetypal space so uh, i am not doing an ethnographic reading or an anthropological or even um, an archaeological digging of that one of those early moments when people migrated from uh, asia or africa as asia uh, to to canada so i found i find this very 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 interesting to to really think about so since we were crossing the arctic i would give my uh, i would pose it perhaps my second example of this spatial experience and that uh, second example is of the arctic itself the arctic explorations it's a, it's a very very fascinating field of uh, inquiry field of study uh, we know it's cold up there and there are a number of narratives about the arctic i'll uh, mention maybe three of them and perhaps dwell a little bit more on the last one the first exploration after after the bering bridge uh, uh, archetype archetypal space that moment after that we have this uh, this um, navigator sailor uh, come uh, pirate i don't want to use the word navigator sailor come pirate uh, martin frobisher 
1576, who encountered the unnamed Baffin Islands, islands of the Arctic, Baffin Islands. So one of those early explorations. But then we asked this question, why did this pirate encounter this Baffin Island? Why? What was the whole point of crossing, uh, reaching across the Arctic Ocean? Uh, an Englishman, why would somebody do this? That's again very interesting. That's a very interesting question because we have the seeds of that grand colonial exercise uh, there. They were searching. Frobisher was searching for the famed Northwest Passage to reach India, to reach uh, the land of spices and gold and flying garments, the shorter route. So, uh, so this is a very, very fascinating journey. Started, uh, not started, no, the early recorded incidents that we have of the English sailor uh, going across the Arctic, uh, trying to discover the Northwest Passage. Now, uh, it's it can be seen as a story of um, uh, adventure, of uh, male adventure. And the model, of course, uh, would be the, the adventures of, um, of course, Ulysses, wandering for these, those many years in the oceans. And then you return with all the wound marks and scars to tell the story of a hero. So you have uh, Martin Frobisher, um, the sailor come pirate, who would probably return to tell the story he becomes a hero. The second one uh, is after a much longer period, almost 200 years in 1771, July 17th, uh, we have another explorer, Samuel Hearn. Samuel Hearn walks overland to reach the mouth of the Copper Mine River. Now, we would uh, have heard about the Copper Mine River um, uh, when we read about uh, the gold rush, the, Klond the, the gold rush in the Klondike, the Yukon territories, uh, you have uh, uh, the Copper Mine River uh, geographically located there, very significant role it, ha it did play during the Klondike gold rush. So that again transformed uh, the North in a very, very fascinating, engaging manner, which again uh, uh, comes to us in literature in the remarkable poems of um, Robert Service. Uh, in, in this poem, The Shooting of Dan McGrew, that's the poem, which talks about the Klondike Gold Rush. So this way in which that whole adventure was narrativized, fictionalized, but then the the, the, the significance of all those uh, tributaries, the rivulets and the rivers are very, very engaging, very interesting, very important because you have uh, the explorers uh, uh, getting a feel of a very different kind of a terrain and a climate. And that itself transforms uh, their understanding of geography and the spaces that they were traversing and how were they traversing these spaces their their ships were loaded with a whole lot of materials these ships were heavy these ships were heavy because they were carrying a substantial part of europe with them now this is something that we need to bear in mind when we look at the third example that i would like to know the not the third one, the fourth one, but then let me talk about the third one. The third one um, was uh, in 1789, before the publication of the Lyrical Ballads, of course, July 12, 1789, when Alexander Mackenzie, he sees a river, and that river is known by his name, Mackenzie River. He sees the Mackenzie River Delta from a canoe. So that, again, is another history of exploration 
and this naming act is very fascinating the way in which europeans uh, named uh, wherever they went it was all named in the name of it was all in the name of the king christopher columbus thought he reached india and he reaches uh, the united states shores of united states and calls and calls the people the red indians it was a misnomer it was a mistake and we say that he discovered uh, america america was already there but then there is this act of naming that is probably one way in which we try to make sense of geography because that's exactly what columbus was trying to do he was trying to make sense of a geography which he had never seen before so uh, um so it is like i said earlier it's not just that place that soil there's much more to it when we talk about geography so alexander mackenzie and then uh, i'll very quickly mention three expeditions by the same person i'll talk about the first and the third one in a little detail and that's perhaps the most uh, celebrated uh, almost uh, which has reached uh, mythological mythical proportions and those are the the adventures explorations of sir john franklin 1845 sorry uh, 1819 to 1822 that was the first exploration there's a second ex- exploration third exploration was a fatal one 1845 uh, the third venture with 130 sailors on board there were two ships um naming is very important erebus erebus the son of chaos brother of night and the second one the terror we don't have to say anything more about that the terror now what's really interesting is that um franklin never returned after the third exploration exploration all 130 vanished in the arctic space their bodies have not been found this is something about the arctic it tells us a lot about the movement of people about the way in which we make sense of geography about the way in which we make sense of place uh much has been written about this people have written a lot about uh, about about uh, franklin there are even narratives that franklin himself had written and uh, 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 i will very briefly just mention this this one particular uh, uh, adventure uh, story that he uh, that he narrates uh, where he talks about an indigenous woman uh, a young woman who had apparently saved his life and he transforms that whole thing into a romantic love story and uh, this is a story of princess pocahontas uh, it goes back to the story of uh, john uh, john franklin's story of princess pocahontas which um, has been discussed uh, remarkably by peter hume in his book colonial encounters i won't go into that book again but then uh, the pocahontas story is interesting very fascinating because uh, that uh, experience of geography where the geography overwhelmed franklin uh, gets uh, uh, gets uh, refurbished uh, has a new avatar becomes another uh, kind of uh, archetype uh, leads a very different kind of a, or is a very different kind of a semiotic experience when we think of uh, uh, Walt Disney making uh, a film on the Pocahontas narrative and the websites that were created the interactive websites on the Pocahontas narrative which is another experience of space so uh, you have the franklin narrative so there is this whole remarkable journey of this quest for the northwest passage which in itself has uh, generated like i said a whole lot of uh, stories uh rudy weeb a very very prominent um, very important uh, canadian novelist uh, 
talks about uh, traveling, uh, moving across the Arctic in one of his very famous, remarkable collection of stories, essays, uh, called Playing Dead. Uh, I would very briefly read uh, two or three sentences from what Weeb has to say there. Uh, I'll, uh, I hope that is permitted. Uh, to live in the Arctic, a human being must, generally speaking, move quite a lot to acquire enough food. Therefore, in order to live, he, she must become a linear dimension in a linear space. You have to be on the move. That is what he says. That means that another moving person, also linear, will certainly find them because even in the largest space, their moving lines must at some point intersect. There were no street lamps, no Google, nothing. So how do you find another person? How is it that you'll survive this whiteness, the terror of the snow and of the Arctic? Even in the larger space, their moving lines must at some point intersect. And the very rarity of these lines in the empty Arctic, empty is within quotes, makes them all the more conspicuous. So if you do not move, you are dead. You have to be on the move. Only then will you survive. And movement was very difficult for the crew of uh, Franklin's ship because they were all heavily loaded with materials. They thought that they could bring their own food and travel with food. But then mobility becomes difficult when you have uh, that baggage with you. So it's a, it's a very, uh, very perceptive comment, which tells us a lot about that very specific experience of space in Canada. So this takes me to another uh, possibility. This is my third example. Now, will it be possible to theorize about mobility then? How does one theorize about mobility? Now, I was talking about uh, the Arctic. I was talking about moving across the ice and how you have to be on the move constantly. So from the Arctic, let us jump to a hockey rink in Canada. That story of mobility provides a lot of insights into Canada's national sport, hockey. Hockey is Canada's national sport. It's hockey is, hockey is Canada's national symbol. It's a fascinating game for those who have watched it. It's the fastest game in the world. You cannot stand, you cannot be static on the ice because there are four uh, uh, periods in the game of 15 minutes duration. So uh, that's all you have. 15 minutes, 15 minutes, 15, 15. This is the duration. It's a very fascinating game for uh, the agility and the mobility of the players. It's very fast. And because it's fast, one would even talk about the kind of violence that is there in the game. Uh, the, adrenaline, uh, the adrenaline pumped is quite high. Uh, tempers can flare up. Uh, you may have a bloody nose at the end of the game, but that's all part of the game. What would this tell us about mobility? We have been talking so far only about mobility. That is one way in which we make sense of geography. If you have to make sense of geography, you have to be on the move. And for that reason, I think uh, Canadian hockey is a remarkable expression of that sense of geography. Canadian hockey offers a fascinating insight into Canada's geography.
because what happens uh, in a game of ho hockey is this hockey essentially is a spatial experience it's an experience of space but then what it also does is hockey is a game that frees up time let me repeat this hockey as a game frees up time how is it possible if you look at the structure of the hockey rink you have artificially you have you have ice that is created 15 minutes you play normal conditions you play and you skate on the ice the ice would come off 15 minutes you have a machine that comes in it's called the zamboni and the ice uh, is set once again 15 15 15 15 but then sometimes it's all time so uh, penalty all that is calculated you have this extra time so what happens is you have to create ice for play that is the way in which you play hockey if you when you play hockey you create ice for play because if you do not create uh, create ice you cannot play you create ice you create space you create geography so you create ice for play and you discover at that point when you create create ice you discover a space of flows you you discover a space of flows ice on the hockey rink ice becomes ice moments because that is going to decide the outcome of the game so there's a way in which space creates time you you free up time how how not even space creates space frees up time there's a way in which you free up time you create time it's a very fascinating experience when you go and watch a game of hockey so what happens uh, in the hockey rink is this it is an experience of space or the space that is experienced in the ice moments that hockey creates it is for this reason that hockey becomes uh, the quintessential canadian sport because you are freeing up time you experience time and when you experience time you experience a very different understanding you have a very different understanding of space which i would say is entirely different from uh, the experience of space south of the 49th parallel in the united states the quintessential american game not the canadian game the quintessential american game is football not the uh, the euro cup uh, uh, fifa football but what we would uh, probably refer to uh, as rugby it's not even rugby because in american football you you score in terms of territories that you gain and uh, the territory or the space that the territory that you lose but there is no question of losing you play to win you play to win. you play to gain territory that is american football and that is imperialism for you and this is what distinguishes the experience of space in uh, in the U united states and canada so this is my third example of uh, canadian spatial experience i'll give you a fourth example we started off um, with people migrating crossing the bering bridge talked about explorations trying to find the northwest passage for purposes of trade jumped to uh, hockey since i mentioned trade it's very important that we dwell a little bit more on trade because i did talk about colonization i did talk about the imperial agenda I, i was talking about how hockey frees time how it creates ice moments what about trade do you does trade free time how does trade free time when we talk about trade it's all business it's all economics 
commodity production, but then time. How is that possible? So I'll give you an example of this. Uh, in in Canada, especially in Western Canada, uh, you have uh, a lot of um, mammals that are called the beavers. The beaver. The beavers are nature's engineers. They are known for the way in which uh, they create dams. So the beavers were killed and their fur was exported. The beavers were killed and the fur was exported. The beaver is a very Canadian, North, North, North American uh, animal. You had the native population there. They would have hunted it for their own purpose, but then there is a demand from a foreign market. So you killed the beaver in large numbers and you exported the fur. Look at what happens. The fur that you exported from Canada created fashion in Paris. The fur taken from Canada, from the beaver, very local, that created fashion in Paris and London. We just need to look at um, uh, Shakespeare's England, for example, or, or Restoration Times, a kind of fashionable society that was very much there in Europe. So beaver pelt created fashion in London and Paris. In other words, I am talking here about two very distinct spatial experiences. One of the beaver in its Canadian habitat and its fur redefining fashionable spaces in European cities. So there are two spatial experiences. Uh, which uh, which tells us a lot about Canada. Fur trade offered its version of a space of flows. I talked about a space of flows. This is what fur trade did. Harold Innes, way back, uh, I think sometime in the 1950s, 40s, 50s, he recognized this space of flows, though he doesn't use the term, the, the phrase space of flows. But then Harold Innes recognized this and came up with a very, very famous remark uh, in his book, The Fur Trade in Canada. He says, the present dominion, talks about Canada, dominion, Canada, the present dominion emerged not in spite of geography, but because of it. It's a very, very famous quotation from Harold Innes. So this was my fourth example. I'll come to my fifth example. So Europeans are already in Canada. Europeans have to settle down. So the next narrative is about settling down in Canada. How do you settle in a new place, in a new country? This is a very fascinating question. This is not a question that I ask. This is a question that is asked by Robert Roach the author on whom I worked for my research. But then how do you settle in a new country? Settlement. The Europeans came and settled there. They were called the settlers. The Europeans are never called immigrants. They are never called the immigrants. They are never called the diaspora. And how do you settle a new country? How did Europe settle new countries? Very simple. You establish colonies. Canada becomes a colony. That's a very different experience of geography. That's a very different experience of space. Because for the people who are already there, Canada was not a colony. So your perception decides the kind of space that you inhabit. There is a 
settlement even to this day there is a place that uh, canada has maintained in 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 the west in western canada in the province of manitoba in winnipeg there's a place called the selkirk settlement uh this was the this is the headquarters of the hudson bay company like the east india company so it is preserved to this day as a very interesting uh, tourist spot so people come we all can go there to this place where you would have people dressed in 19th century costume waiting for lord selkirk who was just who was arriving this newspaper printed in 1882 waiting for him talking about his arrival etc a lot of things happening there so you have the selkirk settlement uh england also uh, published many advertisements which uh, provided a lot of incentive for people to settle down in canada and how do you settle down in canada the land is not very friendly so those who wanted to settle down in canada had to literally rough it in the bush and that's the title of a book roughing it in the bush they had to really uh, they had to really lead a very very tough time tough life even roughing it in the bush because it was bush it was thick undergrowth and you had to clear it the land was fertile but then you had to clear this undergrowth it was hard labor it was very difficult because of the land the climate and how did they do it and that's why you have this title roughing it in the bush the europeans who came there and settled they mimicked european spaces so they would desire very much to have high tea at 3 o'clock in the afternoon when it is biting cold outside and you cannot come out and have your tea in the garden because you had insects that would bite you it was very difficult but then what they did was they tried to create a settlement which was essentially european they try to recreate european spaces in this canadian wilderness that was one kind of um, special experience there is another one which is far more important fascinating for us is the creation of the reserve the creation of the reserve for the indigenous people the native population of canada that's a very different space from where does one get this idea of the reservations it's a word that has come i would say to india from the british we talk about reservations we talk about reserve we have reserves there are other words that we use um garrison for example enclaves there are territories it's ultimately perhaps some kind of an animal behavior because we are all uh, territorially inclined so you have these the birth of the reserves where you said that okay these these people will live only in the reserves because they had already claimed the land in the name of the king or the queen which is a very different experience of space so you have these reserves which created its own problems that is another kind of a special experience and that is another experience of geography one can of course go on about this for example the way in which um uh, the the settlers constructed the canadian pacific railway they constructed the pacific uh, canadian pacific railway from the atlantic coast to the pacific coast and it was a very difficult thing to do in the 19th century they did it for which they needed labor from where did they get their labor not from europe they got cheap labor from china the chinese were very much involved in the construction of the canadian railway and that is um, uh, that building of the canadian pacific railway is immortalized in ej pratt's poem towards the last spike but then what very interesting is that the poem does not refer to the chinese there are photographs of uh, the last uh, spike being driven you will not find any chinese there absence offers its own special experience 
So I will uh, leave the, the CPR and settlement there and then come to the consequences uh, with reference or by referring to the dislocation of the indigenous people. Now, I'm not going to talk about how they were dislocated, but I'll try to draw your attention to a book that was um, published in 2018. It's a book that is titled Keet Sahnak, K-E-E-T-S-A-H-N-A-K, Our Missing and Murdered Ind Indigenous Sisters. If we look at the newspapers the last past two or three weeks, or probably one month, uh, Canada has reported at least two sites of mass burial of uh, young women and children. And this book talks about that. There are all these burial sites. And uh, this is a book that talks about a major project, um, uh, uh, major project about installations, memorials, uh, where uh, they, 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 the, you have this installation of over 2,000 moccasins, the vamps, as they are called, to honor uh, the lives of indigenous women and children, young, young, young women and children who, uh, who perished because they were all sent to residential schools. They were taken away from their homes by the settlers because they thought that uh, the indigenous people did not know how to bring up their children or even raise families. So you do have the lost generation in Canada. So there is this, there is this remarkable uh, movement. Um, uh, and it was a traveling memorial that ran till about 2018. And there was a collective called the um, working, uh, Walking with Our Sisters Collective. They were very much instrumental in it. Uh, I don't know how much more time we have. So I'll quickly run through this project. Uh, the 2014 project, it included 108 pairs of children's moccasin vamps. And there was a big ritual ceremony that was there. People there, the, 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 the relatives of these children who had died, they came, they spoke, they shared memories, food. Uh, so that is a very different experience of the colonized space and how there was healing that happened. It is only an example, one example of how... how a community, I would say, transformed what was known as a triggering space into a sacred space. So you have these kind of spaces emerging in Canada. So what we have now is a layering of spatial experiences that reinforce Canada's time bias, which captures the cultural dynamics of the nation. Now, I would like to conclude with one final example, uh, which perhaps could be a little controversial. I'm not very sure. Let's see how it evolves. This uh, is with reference to, we have talked about, we, I mentioned the, uh, Canada as a nation. This is with reference to the Royal Coat of Arms of Canada. In the Royal Court of Arms of Canada, you have um, a, a, a part from Psalm 72.8. I can't read Latin, so I'll read the English translation. It says, from sea to sea. There's a lot of discussion in Canada. Or there was a lot of discussion in Canada uh, about changing this uh, from sea to sea and then have from sea to sea to sea and then something else also came after that very recently but that alone is not the issue from sea to sea there's a way in which you try to uh, uh, comprehend uh, spaces when you try to uh, have this quote from the psalms not from uh, the the cultural repository the oral tradition of any um, first nations people of canada very, very European, from uh, from the text of a Semitic religion, right? Figuring, finding place in the Royal Court of Arms. Now, let us look at this citation. This is a citation of a geographical reality 
from C to C, which I would say cuts across six time zones. Canada has six time zones. We have one. So this is a citation from C to C from the Psalms. This is a citation of a geographical reality cutting across six time zones. This is a very crucial question. The question of accommodating the spatial experience of a geo-specific people, the First Nations. That is crucial. If you look at the, uh, the, the Royal Coat of Arms, the, the, the emblem, it does not mention the indigenous people anywhere. They do not figure at all in the coat of arms. It refers to the British, the British flag, the French flag, I think the, the Irish, uh, the Scottish, four. No indigenous people. Forget uh, people who, come, who have come from other parts of the world. Four, four, four nations. The indigenous people are missing from there. That is another special experience. That is another special experience. Then the challenge for Canada. What is the challenge for Canada? The challenge for Canada is to register this absent spatial experience in the available spatial monopoly of the founding nations of Canada, which is visible in the coat of arms. How can that be configured there? Because that is a transformative spatial experience. This, I would say, is a very, very big challenge and a task for Canada. So what I'm talking about here, when I talk about the space, is a moment. It is that moment, I've written it down here, because I, I thought it's a slightly tricky, complex formulation. So I'm going to read that out. It is that moment when a nation continues to discover that moment when it discovers the folds of time tucked in the spatial folds of colonial afterlives. And this, in turn, informs the fascinating cultural dynamics of Canada. So I'll wind up by drawing your attention to the cultural, to the flow of people to Canada continues as and beyond the lived and living experiences of colonialism. 358 Professor Nageshwar Rao, I hope I have been, have not taken too much of the time given to me. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, sir. It's really uh, very interesting and uh, we forgot time uh, because of the way we have planned your lecture and you have taken us to Canada and you have shown us many things and it's like you know, eye-catching experiences and at the outset uh, before going to the doubts and clarifications, I must be thankful to Professor Hariharan sir, uh, because you know what a wonderful lecture after a long time and uh, Sarif has touched upon various aspects of Canadian spatial experiences. Uh, those experiences span the Arctic exploration, trade, dislocation of indigenous people, settlement, and different aspects, what not. Uh, it has touched upon the various experiences like cultural aspect, territorial things, geographical things, and historical perspectives. Sometimes you have put us very important and theoretical questions within the framework, taking up, talking about nation and beyond the nation, and uh, talking about the cultural assimilations and all. And 
your lecture i'm sure your lecture is equally worth to 100 books the scholars of scholars and the students definitely uh, they are benefited of your lecture now is open for discussion discussion and clarifications queries responses in yes it's open for discussion i think you have not given any scope for <laughs> doubts and all the lecture went well and not doubt. not doubt but i i also wanted to talk about a lot more things but then i knew that um, this is a one hour program and i didn't want to <laughs> give more i thought that those things yeah no Stop questions from youtube yes yes uh, yeah. uh, professor harian and this was a, an absolutely fascinating perspective which you uh, you know gave us a very uh, in fact uh, it was very very interesting um about uh, what you spoke about the uh, special experiences and uh, especially the, the way you put very beautifully uh, you talked about the absences that are there in the cultural dynamics of the uh, canadian uh, <clears throat> uh, mm -hmm. uh, experience uh, so you know like uh, though i agree completely agree with what you said and i'm really really uh, i was really fascinated by the perspectives that you have given us uh, does it um, you know in the indian post colonial perspective uh, we do not have those absences Uh, which you spoke about you know those people uh, these indigenous people which who uh, have not been uh, now they are now being you know brought into the fold again so um, we do not have though do you think we don't have that kind we of we have that i think we have we have those absences Uh, yes that's I, what I, even i feel though there yeah. has been a lot of talk about uh, you know the people who were involved in those uh, in the building up of this uh, british uh, india yeah uh, but i think there had there, there needs to be a perspective on those people who have not been talked about do you think yes. like that yeah absolutely i absolutely agree with you see we we talk for example of uh, i talked about the indigenous people of canada now yes. who are the indigenous people in india yes right so let let us even start from the uh, we are not talking about other formations but then we are talking about people as people people who would have uh, used uh, their uh, immediate surroundings in a certain fashion and yes. they would have tried to relate and engage with it yes and look what has happened to that the way in which uh, we have damaged a whole ecosystem in the yes. name for example of development yes now you know we are nowhere right now we have to yes. find another space for ourselves now exactly exactly Th that that is that is why i said uh, uh, that is why i thought it's very important to rethink what we understand by geography yes because because th there is a very tried i don't want to say tried and tested but a very very conventional way in which we even teach geography to children when for example yeah. in in our classrooms for example uh, yeah. when when we when we uh, teach when we introduce uh, uh, a text of a poem when we for example when we teach a poem like tinter nabi mm -hmm. what right. do we tell anything to our, to to students about the sense of place that you have in wordsworth yes and what uh, actually tinter nabi looked like exactly we don't do that we don't do that no, yes. yeah, yeah because because there is a way in which uh, that poem would have created a certain uh, sense of space for himself and there's a way in which he would have recreated that space at yes. that moment of composition but then when we read the poem when we teach the poem all yes. this vanishes because we don't we don't we are not bothered about that because what yes. we are bothered about are the exams and the answer the student is going to write whether the student is going to write anything or even use the word transcendental in the in the essay the student gets yes. lost it's unfortunate yes and that's what even i believe you know like uh, we must have a map or a 
pictures of you know because you know when the poet is composing something he is in absolute engagement with his surroundings yeah so and if i am trying to explain i cannot True. do it without that uh, you know without explaining that kind of engagement True. because Isn't these it? yeah these narratives are profound because they have a remarkable sense of history yes. and this is the way in which we try to get hold of that history arrive at that history which yes unfortunately and, we miss out yes and that and the history and the geography yeah. uh, you know we have been separating both of them exactly we, exactly we, absolutely we, right. i completely agree with you we uh, that, absolutely right and and what the the other thing i was trying to do here was yes. to try and see if it will be possible well i've been trying to do this for quite some time now i'm trying to see if it will be possible to, to understand space speciality without referring to european heavyweights who have theorized on the subject oh yes yes we need to get out of that <laughs> paperweight which is there on the us we yeah. need to move out a little bit you know and have our own spaces yeah there's somebody here ask wants wants to ask something pradeep ta mukherjee yes thank you so much thank you thank very you. much thank you yeah dr pradeep ta mukherjee yeah um good afternoon uh, professor hari haran and good afternoon to all audience and professor konda sir is also here i hope i am audible i have a very yes. poor net net connection at home today but somehow i managed to log in and listen through the entire lecture because i found your lecture absolutely fascinating as uh, madam usha madam just uh, you know mentioned that your lecture was fascinating and i despite you know a very bad net connection i could listen to your lecture i am dr pradipta mukherjee from the department of english university of calcutta yeah yes sir i i uh, really don't know whether i should at all ask you a, a question because you speak so well about canadian spatial experiences my question is very basic because you talk about uh, diaspora you mention migration mobility movement which is also fascinating the hyphenated existence our hyphenated existence everything you talk about and you remind me so much of my own co-edited book which is titled uh, the diasporic dilemma exile alienation and belonging which i co-edited a few years ago so i just wanted to know a very basic thing sir because i maybe because of uh, the shortage of time you could not elaborate like how are these you know this concept of di- diaspora migration mobility movement that you talk about how is this uh, related to the concept of archetypal spaces uh, which which you which you actually started off with you, when you when right. you started your lecture you talked about archetypal spaces yeah, and you right. gave a very good examples from you know you talked about the klondike gold rush you talked about hockey as a quintessential canadian sport just as football is a quintessential american game you mm-hmm. talked about the fur trade in canada but if you could slightly elaborate on the concept of archetypal spaces in relation yeah. to diaspora and migration this is my first question right. and the second question is um something which you mentioned is very interesting you talk about these european settlers and why they are known as european settlers and not european immigrants uh, yeah. so could you also talk about this you know about the politics which has gone into the making of this kind of mm-hmm. nomenclature why right. european settlers and not european right. immigrants yeah. Yeah. so these are okay. my questions yeah, yeah. okay yeah much. sure thank you for that uh, <laughs> like like i said i have tried to uh, this was a, uh, an article that i did uh, some time back for a fresh script uh, that we brought out uh, in honor of professor jamila begum who who retired uh, so where i did uh, write something on uh, i tried to theorize on the hyphen uh, and uh, uh, and that's when i got really interested in this whole thing of hyphenation and diaspora i thought it's important that we try to think about it but then uh, to, to talk about the archetypal space that uh, somebody creates a migrant an immigrant creates uh, what i'm saying is this uh, let's say we have uh, we have a writer from uh, from let's say there's somebody from india uh, going abroad going somewhere else tries to settle down there there is something that we take with us like we do in any journey for that matter when we cross a certain border because uh, i have uh, i have asked myself what happens when we cross borders or what happens to borders when we cross them uh what are the kind of things that we carry with us to this new space which we would like to call home 
So when would this new space that we arrive at, the the the, the host land or whatever, when we arrive there, uh, would we say that I have arrived at the host land? I would always like to go home. But then when I when I when I reach arrive at this place. Uh, there's a way in which I learn. I tell myself that I'm going to make myself at home. Home is an archetypal space. Right? Home is an archetypal space. So wherever I go, I try to make myself at home. So that is one way in which, for example, uh, people who move, people who migrate, People who try to settle down somewhere, they try to create this home. They try to create this archetypal space. I, I hope I hope that uh, that uh, answers in a way the question that you raised about the archetypal space, because it's the, because this is something that you can repeat n number of times. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Absolutely. Yeah. I got yeah. my answer. <laughs> right, and then and then when you when you come to the, the second one about. Um, uh, why is it that they are not called immigrants? Because it, this is what happened. Because they, uh, the, the Europeans, uh, came first. They, they were the first ones to reach there. And uh, what they have done is, they, I would say, they, they exercised that prerogative. The land was claimed in the name of the king or the queen. A European battle was fought in North America. The French were kicked out. You still have a French population in Canada. You don't have the French in the United States. Yes, sir. yes. Then you have a French, a French-speaking population in in Canada. 1812 exactly. battle. Uh, that was when uh, uh, the Americans were defeated, and that's why Americans decided to stay uh, south of the 49th parallel. Americans wouldn't like to hear this, but that's a fact. Now, <laughs> now. Uh, 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 settling down because they came there and they decided who would want who would come there. They had these immigration laws, policies that they evolved over a period of time because they wanted another Europe in Canada. See, that is the reason why they thought it's important, let's say, to introduce the railways. The Canadian Pacific Railway was intended just for that. The reservations were created just for that. The advertisements uh, that appeared in newspapers uh, in England or even in Canada were meant only for that. Because you needed to have another colony. You didn't want anyone who was not white skin. Very simple. And if you got people with black skin, they would be slaves. So it is that same established paradigm. So whoever came, they could come only with permission. And so they had very strict laws. So if you look at the National Anthem of Canada, it will not talk about the immigrants. It will not talk about people who have come in. It will not talk about uh, the indigenous people. But Canada will talk about the two solitudes, one French and the other English, and the two will never meet. They talk about many things. There are all these differences. And... Uh, and and yet, that perhaps is uh, the most fascinating thing about this about this space about about Canada. Uh, when we talk about Canada, we we, talk, we we say that it's a diaspora. We would say that uh, Canada is known for its multiculturalism. It's a very sweeping generalization that we make. We talk about Canada being multicultural, uh, and then we would also say that it is multicultural. So you ask, what is multicultural about Canada? And then you say it's a silent bowl. Right? You say it's a silent ball, but then we stop at that. But I've tried to, uh, ever since I heard this, I have always uh, tried to look very carefully at a salad bowl with a whole lot of fruits cut into it with a lot of ice cream. You have diversity and then you have all those connections, all those linkages that I was trying to um, talk about, that culture, that that. Uh, that dynamics, that creation of those spaces, the kind of uh, the the material, let us say, that bonds a piece of pear with a piece of apple, or or one uh, grain of pomegranate in in a bowl of salad, in, in an ice cream salad bowl. Uh, 
and a lot of things would happen when you try to examine those relationships so there are all these differences uh, uh, you have people coming to canada settling down being designated in different ways and yet and yet trying to perhaps recognize the materiality of existence i think that is probably one way in which one can understand uh, or even relate to the idea of certain people uh, settling down and exercising that prerogative of having come there first and then using that to bring in a whole lot of legislation which said for example the chinese when they came there they could not bring their family and they had to pay something called the head tax it was a very retrograde step the japanese came there but then again uh, they they could come they could not come directly they ca- they, they had to come directly but then no ship used to sail directly all right no ship used to sail directly to canada it had to stop somewhere and if you stop somewhere then you could not uh, uh, dock anywhere in canada so there were these uh, kind of structures so even if for example there was a ship called the komagata maru uh, with 130 or uh, people from uh, all of sikh origin uh, leaving Jap- uh, it was a japanese ship uh, reached canada they were not allowed uh, they were not allowed entry and they were sent back uh, they they returned to india they returned uh, to a place near somewhere in west bengal i forgot the name of that place and uh, 95% 98% of them perished they were british citizens because this was in 1917 roughly around that time this happened because they had very specific policies which said no to people who did not have white skin that so was conceived as a white na- nation but then uh strange are the ways of spaces that uh, it has become uh, you, you have you have the world so to speak in canada thank you, thank you very much thank you so much for explaining in such great detail thank, thank you. you yeah thank you sir thank you very much for your wonderful experiences and wonderful observations on indian spatial experiences again it's my turn to propose a formal vote of thanks uh, to the lecturer and uh, uh, really it's a wonderful uh, time and uh, uh, professor ariharan has touched upon every aspect of canadian spatial experience it is a fa- not only a fascinating subject but also the way he has done the presentation is very interesting lively and uh, attracted almost all the uh, presenters here and uh, talking about canadian spatial experiences most of the times we talk about multicultural aspects and we talk about multicultural things of canada but after this lecture definitely it is a rethinking and real looking type of thing uh, about uh, uh, spatial experiences of canada thank you very much sir for your valuable time and thought provoking lecture and observations and ocap never forgets your intellectual inputs and thank you very much for your time and deliberations and your lively presentation uh, and also Uh, your patience answers to the queries by our viewers and presenters thank you sir thank uh, you very much my sincere thanks to us